you doing, everybody? And welcome to Wisconsin Sports on the Go with Trage. I'm your host, Trage. It is Monday. A fantastic Monday here in the great state of Wisconsin. The weather, I mean, you can't beat the weather we've been having as of late here, right? You cannot beat the weather. Yesterday was fantastic. Got a lot of yard work done. Got a lot of yard work done over the weekend there. Talking rain again this next week, so I mean, we can't get away from it, right? It keeps coming back. Keeps coming back. Whether we want it to or not, we get the rain. So it's been fantastic, though, all the way around. A great weekend. Not so much in the Bucks or the Brewers department there. I know we didn't get a chance to uh, jump on on Friday. I had a lot going on. Uh, I couldn't get on to the laptop. Lots of stuff going on. So wasn't able to get a show out last week there, Friday, to talk about that Bucks game on uh, Thursday there. So. I want to get into that Bucks game. I want to get into what we saw and kind of what's coming up moving forward here for the Milwaukee Bucks. We had the Brewers in action over the weekend against the Cubbies, and well, it wasn't as good as what you'd hope for, but, you know, wins and losses, right? Wins and losses. We move on. We move on. That's all we can say. That's all we can say after that series there. So lots to jump into today. Lots to jump into. Right away, I want to look at that Bucks series. Are that well the series? I want to look at that Bucks game and kind of just go over it. What we saw, what we liked in the series, what we disliked in the series. So, looking at this, uh, it was game. We were in game six here against the Pacers for this one. Bucks took the loss, one twenty to ninety eight was the final score. And that Damian Lillard did come back. Lillard was back for this game, but. You know, in all reality, was Lillard back or was he a shell of himself in this game? That's what, you know, it, it's what, you know, I I got in arguments with Pacer fans all week long. Was, well, you know, if it, we beat you guys when you had Giannis and Dame, so, I mean, it, it, it wouldn't matter if Giannis was there and it wouldn't matter if, you know, Dame was not banged up and whatever it was and blah, blah, blah. It's like, no. The series changes. I, I really, I truthfully, whether you want to believe it or not, and I get it. I mean, I am I am all for, I talked about this all season long, the Bucs struggles with athletic teams, playing athletic teams, trying to get after them and everything like that. I, I, I blatantly said it, that this was a tough matchup for the Bucs. I said it way before they even drew this matchup was that this is one team I don't want to see in the playoffs simply because they are athletic. And if the Bucs can't hit shots, they will run all over Milwaukee because they defensively, the Bucs are slow. We saw that in this series here. We saw that in this series, multiple games. The games that the Bucs won, they were at the Pacers. I mean, they just couldn't hit shots. I mean, you look at the difference in assist totals. When they got over 30, they won. And that was every game but game one and game five in the series there. And those are the two games the Bucs pulled out. So you look at those stats, you say, okay, the Bucs defensively were not good in this series. We know that. They've struggled defensively all year long, especially in the guard position. In this series, though, it was really magnified with Brooke Lopez. Simply because Brooke, he doesn't have the speed to get out there. He's a seven-footer, but he doesn't have the speed to get out onto shooters. Miles Turner was a prime example. He could not get out on Miles Turner and not be able to or not get beat off the bounce then. You know, if you put if you put Brooke Lopez against a slower big man who all he could do is score in the paint, Brooke Lopez would be fine. He'd be perfectly fine. But it was a matter of they put him in a matchup where he had to defend on the perimeter and that led to a lot of open buckets for Miles Turner. Did it bite the Bucks badly in this in the game six? No. It didn't bite him because Miles Turner only had five points. He was in foul trouble for a majority of it. Didn't get a lot of shots off. But you look at the rest of that roster there. You look at your guys like McConnell. You're not going to win games when a guy coming off the bench in TJ McConnell is getting 20 points against you. You're not going to win games in that scenario. You look at even a guy like Obi Toppin. They had two guys coming off that bench there with 41 points in this game. 41 points off the bench there between two guys for the Pacers in this one. You want to put that in a comparison to the Bucks? The Bucks had, in total, uh, let's see. They had three from Connington, two from Beasley. They had two from Andre Jackson Jr. They had two from Chris Livingston, and they had one from Gallinari. 
They got 10 points off the bench compared to 41 for the Pacers from two guys. That's not to mention that they got scoring efforts from a couple other guys. Not a lot of, you know, big scoring there. Brown had two, Shepard had three, and four from Jackson there. But you look at the difference in the bench scoring. The bench beat the Bucks. just that was it. I mean, you, you have enough problems throughout a series trying to control the likes of, you know, Tyrese Halliburton and Miles Turner and Pascal Siakam. But you look at this game here, you slowed down the starters. It was a matter of you allowed 41 points off the bench. So that's defensively. Defensively, not able to stop the penetration. McConnell's not a great three-point shooter. We saw that. The Bucks left him wide open. They said, dude, pull it. And he did. He had two of them in this game. I Hats off. Hats off to him. He hit two big threes for the Pacers in this series here. But defensively. The Bucs, I mean, it it really showed. And, and, you know, you really compare this Pacers team, you look at even a team like the Warriors, what the Warriors were able to do to Milwaukee when they went out, out west and played the Golden State Warriors. I mean, you saw how unathletic, yeah, and it's not that they are not athletic, you know, but they, they aren't as quick. They aren't as quick defensively. They can't guard fast guards. And that really showed in this series, in that game against Golden State, it showed all over the place. And when shots aren't falling for the Bucks, they can't hit answer shots. They can't get stops. We saw that here. We saw it. They they close gaps. I believe, you know, truthfully, if you look at every single one of these games, the Bucks would go down big and they'd close the gap. They'd get it down to two. They'd get it down to one. Whatever it was, to three, five, whatever you want to say. And they just couldn't get a stop. They couldn't get key stops. The Pacers always had the answer. For every one of Milwaukee's shots, they had the answer. They'd come back down. They could go on a uh, 0 for 5 uh, drought. They could go about two minutes without scoring the Pacers could. And then they'd find a bucket. And then they'd find a bucket. And it was like, well, you know, this was, you know, you look at that game, um, this game here, game six. Bucks had it down to, what, eight or six at one point there, getting later in the game. And all of a sudden it was 20. And it was like, what happened? I, I literally just, you know, stepped away to go to the bathroom, came back, and it's a 20-point game. You're like, what happened? In a matter of a minute, the game just flipped. It really, I mean, it, it summed up the Bucks season. It, it, this series summed up the Bucks season. They had, it, it was a roller coaster of a year where at times they made you believe that they had the keys. They could do it. And then all of a sudden they had that stretch of games. And it was like, oof. You know, this ain't going so well. Now, do I truthfully believe that if Giannis played in this series at full health and they I mean nobody's at full nobody's at full, you know, full speed, full capacity at this time of year, right? This is late in the season. This is late in the season here. And you cannot just guarantee that any of these guys are going to be completely healthy. But we're talking about having Giannis out there at full strength and Dame out there at full strength. I mean, I, I truthfully believe that really does help the Bucks against the Pacers, right? You have a guy for the you have a guy to answer Pascal Siakam, right? You needed a guy to defend Pascal Siakam. You had needed a guy who could come off the bench and body up on Miles Turner. That was your Bobby Portis. That was your guy. You know, so matchups were changed simply because Giannis was not out there. And that was a big killer there. Now, you know, looking at this game six, the big thing, and I really enjoyed, you know, the game before game five, a lot of Andre Jackson Jr. and a lot of A.J. Green, you know, not on the offensive end as much, but seeing him on the defensive end. Those guys are quick. Those guys get after some of these guards. They're able to stop the penetration. They're able to slow up the pacers, slow up the transition. And, you know, we go into game six, and all of a sudden Dame comes back. So now that changes the entirety of the game plan, and we don't see those guys. We see Andre Jackson Jr. for five minutes and A.J. Green for five minutes. Those guys play valuable minutes. That's my biggest problem. That's my biggest issue with the usage that Doc Rivers had with this bench for the Bucs. The lack of use. I mean, you saw Connington and Beasley in this game. Connington for 16 and Beasley for 23. And they both gave you three points and two points collectively in this game. But you look at the likes of like Andre Jackson Jr. and A.J. Green. Those guys have put up big, big minutes for you in game five, in the absence of Dame. And now you get to this game here, going up against the Pacers in a do or die. 
and we don't trust them. We don't trust them enough to have any part in what's going on in this game. I that 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 bothers me. That does. That 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 part bothered me. I sat there and I was like, you know, we need to stop. We need defense out there right now. The Pacers are cooking. We need defense. Andre Jackson Jr. Obi Toppin was going off. He was having himself a game. Put Jackson Jr. out on him, right? This guy's got length. He's got speed. He's got, you know, the ability to get out on shooters. That's him. That's his MO. That's what he came out of college doing. That's his job. So you put him in there. I'm sorry, but I love me some Patrick Beverly, but he did not play his best series defensively in this series against Pacers. He didn't. He didn't whatsoever. I, you know, honestly, Middleton had 14 points in game six of this series, but. The way that this guy played the series, the way that he kept us in games, the way that he banged it around and tried to carry this limping team as far as he possibly could, hats off to Chris Middleton. This guy was injured. I mean, and you you might not think so, but how many times did I see this this guy roll himself up out there on the court, get back up? I mean, the one, I I can't remember what game was there. He ran into the tunnel and then came back out and he jumped back in. And he was hurt. He was hurting. That ankle was hurting. And he just jumped back in. He he knew he had to. He knew that they needed something. And he was he had to be that something for the Milwaukee Bucks. He had to be. So my ultimate from this series, what I saw is I mean, this team, if this is if they don't trust the bench enough, they lack depth. If we're going to stick with Brooke Lopez, we need to change other pieces out there. Because Brooke Lopez is not good defensively anymore. Not on the perimeter. On the interior, if you want to drive at Brooke Lopez, that's going to be his bread and butter. He's going to get some block shots. That's going to be his place to be. But outside of that, Brooke, I like Brooke Lopez, but I would rather see the Bucks bring in a, a backup or a number one center and have Brooke come in as a replacement. You need a big that can defend. The way that the NBA is going right now, you look at the amount of quality big guys out there who are athletic that can get around, Bam out of Bayou, uh, Joel Embiid, you have Nikolai Jokic out there, Anthony Davis. You have a lot of good bigs out there who can not only score around the cup, but they can score it on the perimeter too. And Miles Turner showed us in this series that he can be a quality big. So, I mean, you look at those guys, Carl Anthony Towns, I just keep thinking of him as I'm sitting there. You think of those guys there and you say to yourself, okay, we need somebody to defend him. Is Brooke Lopez the first guy that comes to mind? No. Not anymore. Not anymore. He, he's not athletic enough to do it anymore. So in that sense, you need to find some defense there. I, and I get it. You know, the NBA isn't all defense anymore. It's not about that. It's about scoring buckets and everything like that. I get it. I mean, I've complained about the defense in the NBA for a while. But you need guys to at least put hands out there. I can't tell you how many times I saw Miles Turner line up a wide open three in that series against the Bucs. Did he always hit it? No. But I can't tell you how many times I saw it. And sometimes it gets old, you know, and you got to have an answer for it. You got to, you know, because then if you go to this rotating game, it puts him in a bad spot then for a mismatch, right? And then you all of a sudden you have, let's just say Chris Middleton or Beasley guarding Miles Turner down in the post. That doesn't do you any good. And then if Brooke tries to slide down, now you have open kickouts. So you can't play these games with Brooke anymore. You can't. You have to find yourself a quality, athletic big man who can defend. You have to. You have to. If you're going to stick with this core, if you're going to stick with Damon Giannis and Middleton, you have to find somebody to back them up. You got to find some backup pieces. You have to. You have to find some bench pieces out there that you trust. I like Andre Jackson Jr. I like Beach Camp. I I do like AJ Green. I just they don't use them. They don't use them. I hope that changes, but until it does, they need to find pieces. They do, and you know that that leads me into you know I've seen a lot of people talking about well let's trade away you know Middleton, let's trade away Dame, let's you know break up this core. I don't know why you do. You know you didn't really get a season with these guys. And with Doc Rivers. You didn't get a year. I I get it. Doc Rivers has never been this outstanding coach who, you know, you can just sit there and say, this is the best coach that's ever done it. He's like Phil Jackson kind of guy. No, 
No, nobody's ever accused Dak of being that guy. But what I'm saying is you got to give this a chance. You know, you can't just bring in Dame for one season. Giannis gets hurt. Middleton's banged up for most of it. And, you know, he gets hurt too. I mean, Dame gets hurt. And you can't just say, well, you know, it failed. We got to move on. You traded Drew Holiday for this guy. You know, one of the, I mean, this was Giannis is one of his better teammates, one of his better friends, right? And you, you let him go. You trade him away. Now he's with the Celtics. What's it going to show if you go and you trade away Damian Lillard now? And you just say, well, we did this move. It didn't work. We blew it. We technically, I mean, you didn't blow up your core, but you did, right? Because the core that won the championship was Drew Holiday, Middleton, and Giannis. I mean, Brooke was there too, and you had P.J. Tucker. But you're talking about the three guys, the three big guys in that run were those three. And you blew that up. You traded away uh, Drew for Damian Lillard, a guy who is supposed to improve you offensively. Be able to be that big, big game, big shot guy. He wasn't that guy for you. So now if you blow that up, and I hate, I, I love listening to Stephen A. Smith because he still believes that Dame doesn't want to be there, even though he has told every single person, you know, that I, I want to be here. Like the, he's talking about the off season and training and everything like that with Giannis and getting closer with Giannis and everything like that. It's like, Sounds like a dude who wants out. I, I, I am, I am for bringing the core back. I am Dame Giannis Middleton. I am for bringing that back. I, I for sure am. You know, Bobby's coming back. I want Bob. I keeping Bobby around. You know, not don't get rid of Bobby. Andre Jackson Jr., AJ Green. I think those are good young youth players you can build around. And, I mean, you're going to keep the Nassas because that's what keeps Giannis uh, happy there. But Jay Crowder, uh, Gallinari, I'm keeping Beach Camp, too. You know, you got him. But Jay Crowder, Connington. Uh, I wouldn't be opposed to Beasley coming back. I mean, he's a spotty shooter. At, he struggled a little bit there, consistently shooting the basketball. But I'm not opposed to Beasley coming back. But, you know, so Beasley, uh, Andre Jackson Jr., Green, uh, Beach Camp. Those are the guys I'm bringing back. Connington, I'm saying you can walk out the door. Brooke Lopez, uh, I'm trying to find, figure out a way to restructure that contract. Because if you can't, I mean, defensive, offensively, he can still give you buckets, mostly on the perimeter. He did play a little bit more inside on the, in this series against the Pacers, but mainly he's an outside threat. But defensively, it gives you, I mean, not much anymore. So, it, you know, to me, Brooke Lopez is a guy I can let walk. You know, I can find a trade suitor and send him out the door. And, you know, Patrick Beverly, I mean, this is a guy who I would be okay with coming off the bench, but you need to find a running mate for Damian Lillard. I think you do. You know, I like Pat Bev, and I like Pat Bev's uh, tenacity, the way he gets after guys, the way that he adds a spark. I, I, I'm not saying I, I don't like Patrick Beverly. What I'm saying is in extended minutes, the way that he can, he doesn't, he's not a, he's not a threat. He's not a threat that you need out there, right? Beasley's a threat to shoot the basketball. I, I don't fear Pat Bev shooting the basketball. So that's where my only thing comes with finding a running mate for Damian Lillard. You know, like you look at him in Portland. He had C.J. McCollum. McCollum was a pretty good running mate. You know, the guy, he could bang shots with you. He gets you open shots because he demands a presence. Pat Bev did not demand a presence. You know, so that that was a kicker for this team. So that that's where I'm at. I mean, I'm bringing back the core, though. I, I am. I'm running this thing back. You have to. You have to run it back and just see what happens. Because I believe, you know, you run this back, this team has still got some juice in it. I really do think they did. Middleton played a lot better down the, down the stretch in the season here. Dame, I mean, Dame never really played bad. He just, it wasn't the Dame that we remembered in Portland, right? And it might have been trying to find his role with this team yet. This team was still trying to find roles. It's not like it was, you know, they had a lot of time before the season started. And then once Doc came in, it was in the middle of the season. And then they're trying to regroup. So that could be a big kicker to that too. Middleton, I feel like he was always trying to find his role when it was Dame and Giannis both out there. I felt like Middleton was still trying to find his role on this team. So, I mean, I'm like I said, I'm all for bringing this core back and running it back there. But, I mean, that's all about, that's about all I got. Pacers, Bucks, we saw the end of it. 
Bucks lose the series. We, I mean, we move on, right? We, there was no Giannis. Dame was beat up for most of the series still. And the Pacers, I mean, they were healthy. They took advantage. They took care of the Bucks. They move on. And now we cheer for the Knicks to beat them, right? It's just what we got to do, right? <laughs> we just we we just got to cheer for the we got to cheer for the Knicks. I I I don't want to cheer for the Knicks, but we got to cheer for the Knicks to beat them there. So with that, that's about all I got for the Bucks. That's all I want to talk about for the day here. We're gonna get more into the Bucks as news comes out and everything like that uh, in the off season here, and talk about the NBA a little bit here coming up this week as some of the second round playoff series start up here. Uh, getting into it, we saw the Cavs win in seven games against the Magic yesterday. So that'll set up that matchup there with the Boston or with the Celtics there and everything like that. And I believe I was just gonna check out when that series does officially start. I know we got Knicks Pacers for sure. That'll be I'm trying to pull up the bracket here, kind of. Yeah, we got Cavs Celtics. That'll be starting up on Tuesday. That'll be the tip off of that one. So that'll be on Tuesday. And then we have tonight here, actually. We're going to have the Pacers and the Knicks squaring off. They will also be accompanied by the Nuggets and Timberwolves, who will tip off tonight, too. And then on Tuesday, we'll also see the Mavericks taking on the Thunder. So we got a couple of good series coming up here between these uh, foes here. I mean, there's still some good good teams left in there. And that West, I mean, that West is going to be a different kind of animal. I That Timberwolves Nuggets series could be like some Cinemax stuff right there. I mean, you might want to be watching that one. Sucks that there are going to be some late games. 9 o'clock start for that one here in Wisconsin. It's 10 p.m. Eastern start for that game. So a little bit later in the night there. But, I mean, if you tape that baby and watch it later, because I believe that could be a very good series between those two teams there. But with that. I want to get to a couple of, uh, I want to get to our sponsors here, the show quick. I want to get to our sponsors here before we move on into the Brewers here and recap that weekend series. So first off, I got game day supply in Alaska. Do you have a sports club or team? Are you looking for some sweet custom uniforms or apparel? Check out the awesome crew at game day supply in Alaska to help your team get the sweetest gear. Find them on Facebook at game day supply or online at game day supply.net. Also, your hometown team, Century 21 Gold Key Realty. Call Peggy, Sue, or Anna to find your dream home or if you're looking to sell. Find them on Facebook at your hometown team, Century 21 Gold Key Realty, or stop in and see them at their location in Marshfield. Also, Sport and Spine Clinic in Greenwood, Wisconsin. If you've been injured recently, whether it was at work, whether it was on the baseball field, the softball field, basketball court, whatever it was, and you need some physical therapy, stop in there and see Chad at Sport and Spine Clinic in Greenwood. He will get you right. He'll get you back to work, back on the court, back on the field. Whatever it is, he'll get you back there. Sport and Spine Clinic in Greenwood, Wisconsin. Marshfield Motor Speedway is located just three miles outside of Marshfield on County Road H. You got to get down to the track this summer. Tons of family fun. Whether you're a kid, whether you're an adult, they got great food. They got great drinks. They have great action. That's all you can ask for in a summer day there. Great stuff happening down at the track. Find the schedule on Facebook. Just search Marshfield Motor Speedways or find the schedule online. Just search Marshfield Motor Speedways. Otherwise, I shared it on the Facebook page. Look up Wisconsin Sports on the Go Trage. That's the Facebook page. You will find the schedule there. I shared it, I believe, last week at some point. There. So you'll find the schedule there. Also, sports scenes, sports cards, and memorabilia located in the Marshfield Mall in Marshfield, Wisconsin. You got to get down there and see Al. He has everything you need from sporting cards to memorabilia, jerseys, model stock cars. He's got it all down there at the store. So check him out in the Marshfield Mall there, sports scene in Marshfield, Wisconsin. And also Pittsville Farm and Home Center. They got all kinds of flowers on sale right now. They got flower extravaganza, we'll call it, down there right now. The greenhouse is open. They got hanging baskets galore. I was talking to one of my cousins. He said he had to go down there and help his uh, uncle move some, or help his father-in-law move some of the flowers inside there so i mean you got to get down there great stuff happening down at pittsville farm and home there in pittsville wisconsin there so with that i gotta get we gotta get into the brewers we gotta get into the brewers the brewers weekend recap as much as we hate to talk about it because it was the stinking cubs and the cubbies took care of the brew crew over the weekend there so i mean we look at this 
Brewers series here against the Cubbies. Friday, I mean, Brewers played well. Friday was a good game for the Brewers. Not against the starting pitcher. Starting pitchers for the Cubs in this series here, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, the Brewers did not score a run against them. Yeah, they did not. They did not score a run against them. I believe going into Sunday, it was at 12 innings. So they got to actually 18 innings scoreless there. The Cubs starters did. Against the Brewers lineup. So the Brewers go a little bit cold down there in Chicago. But on Friday, I mean, this was a pitching duel. This was a pitching duel through and through all the way up until that sixth inning when the Cubs scored a run there in the bottom half. Brewers came back, though, top of the eighth. They pulled the starter out there, the Cubs did, in Wisniewski, and the Brewers go off. Four hits, they had four stolen bases, they scored three runs there, and got that 3-1 to one lead that they would hang on to and not relinquish the rest of the way. So Brewers win that game 3-1, to one, eight hits for the Brewers, eight hits for the Cubs in that one. Paguero got the win. Alize got the loss for the Cubs there. Trevor McGill got the save for the Brewers. Looking at the hitting for the Brewers in this one. We saw Sal go 0 for 3. Churro came in 1 for 2 on the ball game there. He got the party started there in that top of the 8th. Contreras 1 for 4. He had an RBI single. Tyler Black 0 for 3. Sanchez, he came in there. Uh, he had to. That game was a disaster. Joey Weimer came in. <clears throat> Joey Weimer comes into the game. Bowers moves to first. Weimer goes out to left. Weimer gets injured, so Weimer has to come out. Bowers has got to move back out to left field. We don't have a first baseman anymore because Hoskins is in the DH role. So instead of losing our DH, we move Gary Sanchez, who, I mean, must be fine, not as injured as what we were uh, assuming. He gets out there and he plays a little first base. So, I mean, it was a, it was a nut house. It was a nut house of a time there trying to get things sorted out. No bench players left there. After that whole fiasco. But to go along with that. We saw Adamas. He goes one for four in the game. Bowers goes one for three. He had an RBI. Adamas had an RBI there. Uh, Other than that. I mean. Terang. Two for four. He continues to stay hot. Oliver Dunn. One for two. Ortiz. One for two. So solid days at the plate for a couple of the guys there. For the Brewers. 13 strikeouts. So that's an alarming number. 13 strikeouts on the game there, and Sal Frelick in the leadoff spot. I don't know. I mean, I don't have, I don't have as, I I don't even know if that's a stat that, somebody probably did the stat on it, but Sal Frelick does not bat well in the leadoff spot. And, you know, I, I don't know why we keep him there. I, I love I love having Sal I mean you, okay you look at his you look at this guy and you say to yourself okay I mean he is a solid contact bat he's going to get on he's going to be able to steal bases so he seems like he's your traditional leadoff guy but you know you look at if his stats I tried to pull up the stats there but I couldn't find the stat of him batting in the leadoff game they give us i mean all kinds of crazy stats home games away games day games night games we got everything else in between actually he is better in night games away night games he's batting 273 in away games and at night he's batting 306 so i mean if we give him some away night games that's the problem we played in wrigley during the afternoon that's why they did it to us because they know that sal's the man and Sal can hit at night, so that's why I schedule him at 120. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That That isn't it. But, I mean, some of these stats out there that they make up are crazy there. But you look at Sal and his split numbers there. And, I mean, look at him in 01 count. He's hitting 6. If he gets 615 when he gets it with uh, 01 count there, that's kind of that's kind of fascinating right there, though. But if he gets late in the counts, if he gets late in the counts there, not a solid batting average if he gets, I mean, anything worse than that. I mean, 0-2 counts. Right now he's hitting 0-71, 0-71 on the year there. I mean, his best batting average, to be honest, is in an 0-1 count. 
And in 0-1 County, is batting 615, eight hits in 13 at bats. But if he does not get his pitch and he works it to let's just say a one two count or a one one count, he is uh, hitting two hundred in one one count. And in a one two count, he's batting two thirty eight. That is interesting stuff right there. I I wouldn't have believed that stat if you would have, if you would have told it to me. I would have thought he was better behind in the count there, but apparently not on that one. But I mean, just from memory, because I cannot find the stat other than that. So just from memory. I can tell you this much. When he has batted in the fifth or sixth spot this year, Sal Frelick has hit the ball well. He has actually had a couple of very good games batting towards the bottom. I'm not saying he hasn't had a good game in the leadoff spot. But what I believe is, truthfully, we had the situation with Yelich where he couldn't hit anywhere but the leadoff spot. I'm pretty sure Sal Frelick is the reverse. I'm pretty sure he's the opposite. And if you moved him down to five or six, I think he would hit a lot better. Now, right now, do they have another leadoff hitter in their lineup? I mean, you could move Contreras up there. Yes, it takes him out of that RBI spot in the two hole. But right now, your bottom of the lineup's getting on, or your bottom of the lineup is getting on a lot. So I think, truthfully, moving Contreras up would not hurt anything. Bryce Terang's been hitting the baseball very well this year, and you know that guy can steal bases. I wouldn't see him as a bad option to move up to the top of the order at some points here. Also, I mean, Blake Perkins. This dude can hit. We know he can hit. He's been hitting all season long. The average is going, it's dipping a little bit. He has struggled as of late here. But outside of that, Blake Perkins has hit the baseball well. So you have guys that you can switch in there in the leadoff spot. I love me some Sal Frelick in the leadoff spot. And I know it's early. So you can't jump to conclusions on anything like that. But I'm just saying from what I've seen so far, and if I could find the stat, I wish I could because I really truthfully believe his average is higher hitting towards the bottom half of that lineup than it is hitting in the leadoff spot. I really do. So, I mean, that's the only thing that I had with Sal Frelick. Interesting, though, that they have this location, time, and surface. On grass, he is hitting 252. So if they play on grass, we know Sal is going to be okay. He's got he's only, play, only played on grass this year, so he's hitting 252 on grass right now, according to this site. I don't think it's updated yet here. But, I mean, that's just... That's a crazy stat there right now. I, they come up with everything. They come up with everything nowadays there. So, I mean, that's all I had coming out of that one. Pitching-wise, Joe Ross pitched very well. I thought Joe Ross pitched fantastic to open up this uh, weekend series there. He was in a duel. I mean, we like I talked about there, with the Cubs starting pitching over the weekend, Cubs starting pitching was fantastic. I don't want to, you know, prop up the Cubs there, but they had some good pitchers out there. Was Nesky, I mean, six and a third, three hits, two walks, eight strikeouts, zero runs given up. This guy was dealing. He, I mean, guys got on against him. They had opportunities, but they just couldn't push across runs. And Joe Ross pitched fantastic in this just to duel it out with him there. Six innings, six hits, one earned run, four strikeouts, and a home run given up. That was it. Your one earned run came from a home run there. You don't beat yourself up too much on that one. That's a solid day. Elvis Paguero, an inning, one hit. I mean, Paguero... He's been nothing short of fantastic for the Brewers here as of late. This dude, I mean, he he's I mean, he's had his struggles, right? But who doesn't? Who doesn't have their struggles? But this dude has pitched great for the Brewers in his role. 3.38 ERA. Paguero has pitched solid for Milwaukee. So having him in there, and then Piumps for an inning there, one hit, and then he moved his ERA down to 3.09. And then we saw Trevor McGill close it down. One inning there, one strikeout, a 1.17 ERA after the day there. So good stuff. I mean, coming out of Friday there, Brewers pull it off there late in that one. Moving on to the Saturday matchup. The Saturday game, Brewers lose this one 6-5. to five. And again, this was a lot of Cubs starting pitching is the story of the weekend. We saw Jamison Talon. He goes six innings, two hits, two walks, seven strikeouts. The Cub pitchers, man, they they deal. They were dealing in this series, and the Brewers had no answers in this one. Looking at the box in this one for the Brewers, and like I said, this is Sal Frelick's bounce back game, right? Two for four the next day. So, I mean, I... I could be far fetched. That's just what I've seen so far. Is I like Sal towards like that five or six spot in the lineup. That's just where I think he hits the best. So Sal goes two for four in this game here. Contreras one for five. We saw Tyler Black 0 for five. Adamas 0 for five. Terang 0 for three. Did draw a walk in this game though. Hoskins one for three there with a run scored. 
And then we saw Oliver Dunn, one for four there with an RBI. We saw Blake Perkins go one for three with two RBIs. And Jackson Churro, he goes two for four in this game here with a run scored in this one. Brewers, 11 strikeouts again, though. 11 strikeouts. The strikeout numbers continue to climb for this team here. Not good news on that end. Tobias Myers struggled in his, I mean, in this game against Chicago. Three innings, three hits, four and runs, four walks, two strikeouts, two or two home runs given up. And you know, a lot of fastballs over the plate, a lot of mislocations, and a lot of walks. I mean, early on in this one. But, you know, the one of the things that stood out to me was his ability to battle, though. I mean, yes, he did struggle. I'm not going to say he didn't struggle in this series, but I like Tobias's ability, even at his younger age and just getting up into the bigs, to be able to battle and get out of those innings. Yes, he gave up four runs. I'm not going to say that he had a fantastic day at the ballpark and all bygones should be bygones. But what I'm saying is that this guy, he pitched a good game for, I mean, not a good game, but he he got himself out of trouble. He was in trouble. He got himself out of it without further damage. Four runs is not good, but it's not like it's detrimental, right? You can come back from a 4 nothing deficit. Right now, the way the Brewers are hitting, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to come back from that. But, you know, the pitch count got high, and that was the big thing for Tobias Myers. The location was bad. Couldn't, I mean, walking guys left and right. I mean, that first inning was a disaster. Or was it the first there? Yeah, the first inning, two runs given up, and then the third, two runs given up before he got pulled. So, I mean, but he worked himself out of trouble. So you take your wins with your losses. He's a young pitcher. You got to take your wins and your losses sometimes, and that was one of the wins and losses there. I'm just noticing now. I don't know if you guys can hear that, too. You probably can. But I'm going to need some WD-40 for the old chair here in the studio because, son of a gun, she's getting noisy back there. Can't move. I got to sit still here. So Jared Koenig then. He comes in, an inning pitch there, one strikeout. Hobie Milner for an inning, one hit, and two strikeouts. Diego Vieira, I think they let him keep his glove this time. One inning, he gave up two hits, one earned run, two strikeouts, and a home run given up. And Brian Hudson, this dude, I mean, he he, two innings, one run, two hits, two strikeouts. Finally gave up a run, and it was finally the one that was going to, five, six to five, like that was the run that would have, you know, been the kicker in this one. but. I mean, that dude, Brian Hudson, has pitched fantastic for the Brewers, so he's got to give up a run eventually. That was his run. So, I mean, not a bad day for the Brewers. They lose this one 6-5, to five, but once again, they can't get to the starters. They wait until it's late in this ball game, and then they try to make that final push. Four in the seventh, one in the top of the ninth, and it just wasn't enough to be able to fuel this comeback for the Brewers in this one. So they drop game two, 6-5 to five in that one. Last game of the series here on yesterday there, 5 nothing was the finisher. The Cubs got the win over the Brewers in that one. And Brewers, I mean, seven hits for the Cubs, five for the Brewers in this one. They weren't able to push anything across. From us, Freddie Peralta took the loss for the Brewers there. Assad took the win. He got the win for the Cubs in that one. Assad moves three and zero. Freddie drops to three and one on the year here. Freddie five innings, three hits. Three earned runs, five strikeouts, six walks in this one. Freddie lost his control. He has an inning, right? We've talked about this in the past. It seems like with Freddie Peralta and his outings, he has one inning in a game where he just struggles. He is going to struggle. He's going to give a bomb or something. He's going to give up a run. And if it's a run, it might be multiple, but it seems like it's always one inning. One inning that he struggles, and it was in this one in the fifth, the bottom of the fifth there that the Cubs were able to get to Freddie Peralta there. Vieira, he goes an inning, one hit, one earned run, and a home run given up there. And Jansen Junk for two innings, three hits, one earned run, one walk, two strikeouts. Jansen Junk didn't pitch phenomenal, but he didn't pitch bad. I mean, he got the Brewers. He he kept the Brewers, I mean, relatively in it, right? I mean, not a great outing out of them. Not a great outing all the way around from the Brewers pitching in this one. Everybody giving up runs there. But, I mean, that's just the way the series went. That's the way the series went for the Brewers in this one. It just wasn't a good series for Milwaukee all the way around there. Sal Frelick one for four on the game there. Uh, Contreras one for three, one for four from Black. And then we saw a lot of offers. Adamas, Terang, Hoskins all go 0 for four, 0 for three. Uh, Oliver Dunn, one for four. Blake Perkins, one for four. And then we saw Churro uh, go 0 for two before Bowers came in and went 0 for one on this game here. So 
I mean, would you have loved to go down to Chicago and pick up two wins and get or get series sweep? Yeah, nothing would have made it better. Nothing would have made it better. But, you know, truthfully, I think we learned a lot about Milwaukee in this series here. They are not as good at hitting as what we thought. I mean, they're. I'm not going to say the Brewers aren't that good, right? I'm not going to say. I, I I truthfully believe the Brewers are still the best team in the division. But what I, you know, this was a, I, I hope, was a wake-up call, right? You need a wake-up call at some point here. The Brewers are playing well. They were winning series. I mean, they had that crap show against the Yankees. But outside of that, they were winning series. They were, their offense was high and mighty. And I think, you know, Hopefully, going down to the south, to the south, getting beat by the Cubs, that's that wake-up call. That's a fuel to the fire that says, hey, we aren't untouchable. The Cubs are still there behind us. We're not going to win this baby without, you know, we, we got to go back to what made us successful here to start the year, the small ball, the putting the ball in play, beating it out, you know, I mean, battling, battling in games. That's where the Brewers have to get back to. I think they've gone a little away from that here as of late. The offense has started to scuffle a little bit. I really, truthfully believe this was the wake-up call they needed. They needed something like this, and the Cubs gave it to them. The starting pitching for the Cubs in this series gave it to the Brewers. They said, hey, we're better. We're better, and you guys are going to feel that, and Brewers did. But now you bounce back, right? You have to. You got the Kansas City Royals for three, and then you go right away and you play St. Louis, and then you got the Pirates for three. So, I mean, you have no days off here. You have no days off to recoup, to refresh. You just got to jump right back at it. So, I mean, this series was the wake-up call. I believe the Brewers needed to say, hey, we got to figure it out because these Cubs are for real. They are behind us, and they are for real, and they got Craig Council now, and as much as we don't want Craig, we don't like Craig, Right? This guy knows how to manage baseball games. He knows how to win a lot of close ones. We've seen that over the years in Milwaukee. You can't deny that. You cannot deny that. So now we wait and see, right? Brewers, they have Kansas City Royals coming up tonight here. They have the Kansas City Royals coming up tonight. Bryce Wilson will take on Reagans for the Kansas City Royals. Wilson 2 and 1 of the 3 ERA. And Reagans coming to this one 2 and 2 with a 3.44 ERA. A lefty. A lefty on the mound. Brewers, worst nightmare, lefties. They don't like them, some lefties. For the Kansas City Royals, not a lot of experience against Bryce Wilson. Only three guys there, Hampson, Frazier, and Renfro. Hunter Renfro? Is that Hunter Renfro? I might be learning something. Hunter Renfro is now a part of the Kansas City Royals. I did not know that. I am just learning that now. I remember he went out to the Angels. I did not know what happened to Hunter Renfro after that. Apparently, he is now with... The Kansas City Royals there. Interesting stuff there. So Hunter Renfro in five at-bats. He's got two RBIs against Wilson, a 400 average. Hampson's hitting 1,000 against him. And Frazier is hitting 333 against him there. So a relatively good success against Wilson. The Brewers have not seen Reagans yet. Nobody on the Brewers has seen Reagans. So a relatively young, younger lefty the Brewers will square off with here. So should be a good one. Starting up a series with Kansas City Royals. That'll be a 640 start. Valley Sports, Wisconsin, otherwise on the radio, Brewers Radio Network there, or WTMJ620. Wherever you get the Brewers, they'll be on there. So with that, that's about all I got for today. We talked about a lot of Bucks, Brewers. We got lots more to get into this week. Lots of Brewer talk, lots of Bucks to talk coming up this week here. So with that, I hope you guys, I mean, thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining me on the show here. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your Monday. But until I talk to you guys again tomorrow, this has been Wisconsin Sports on the Go with Trage. Thank you guys for listening. We'll catch you guys back here tomorrow. But until then, deuces. Yeah, oh my Lord, watch me sway. Darkness falls and we all pray Hoping for the light of day Down to the river I have held the devil's hand Felt the weight of my own sin Burdened by the heart of man Down to the river Down to the river